From Hype HQ in Chicago, Illinois, Startup Hype Man presents the Goat to Market Show. What's up, everyone? I am your host, Raj Nation, the founder and chief pitch artist of Startup Hype Man. This podcast is where we bring you founders, company leaders, and creatives who are building it, who are doing it, who have been there and done that. And they pull back the curtain on their go-to-market strategies so that you can build a venture that you love and become the GOAT of your industry. Want first listen on episodes before anyone else? Subscribe to our newsletter at StartupHypeMan.com. You will get alerts every Sunday morning when we release new episodes. All right, let's hear how today's guest is becoming the GOAT. Ladies and gentlemen, making his way to the microphone. Originally from London, England, and currently residing in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. He is the founder and CEO of Cheese. Please welcome Simon Hudson. How are you doing? <laughs> the most <laughs> chill response to that. <laughs> I wish I wish every call started like that. That's cool. I'm gonna uh I'm gonna give some tips to fellow fellow colleagues on the call. That's awesome. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hey, how's it going? It's going great on my end. Great to have you here. As I mentioned, everybody, he is Simon Hudson. He joins us today on the Goat to Market show. He is the founder and CEO of Cheese. What is Cheese? Well, it's an app for the creator economy, letting photographers mint their photos onto the blockchain. They can have more ownership over their work and they can control their narrative as a creator. Cheese is bringing their product to market currently in a public beta. They've already raised $2.5 million in a pre-seed round. Simon himself, in just not that long of time, has had a really good track record of bringing A-plus people to the table in support of cheese. And that's why our topic today is attracting big-name a plus advisors. Simon, once again, welcome to the show. Why is this on your mind? Why is this important to you? Well, firstly, thank you for having me. And again, thank you for the awesome introduction. Um, to be honest with you, I think in any business, whether or not you're a startup or a fully fledged company that's been around for many years, minds from the experts and people that have been th through this before are always great to lean upon. And I think that one of the best inspirations I get and the biggest learnings I get is from listening to audiobooks through travel or reading books when I'm gone in my spare time. And, and I find that these books I read through how companies started always help me learn and understand. And the ones that I really get inspired by, I reach out to the authors and uh, ask them if they'd like to join Cheese. And that's basically kind of how it happens, really. Um, and it seems to be uh, seems to be a, a working model that I found. We're going to dive a whole lot more into that because what you know what he's kind of casually glossing over is he's brought on Guy Kawasaki, Mark Randolph, co-founder of Netflix, Greg Hoffman, who was part of the original Nike team, and all of this has happened through building relationships. So we'll get into how he was successfully able to make that happen and build up Cheese's advisor team to such prominent names. Before we get into all that, let's learn a little bit more about Simon. Now, Simon, you grew up in London, you live in Dubai, you have had a lot of world experience, but I think probably the majority of at least your professional career has been spent in Dubai. Um, what would you say is like the hallmark characteristic of Dubai's startup or tech ecosystem? I think that, I mean, I've been in Dubai now just over 13 years. Um, I moved here uh, through friends I had that had originally moved back in mid to late 2000s. And I believe that Dubai is a city built by an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs. And when I first moved here, things weren't that easy. Um, you still used a paper check, or you still kind of do today. Things were very hard to try and get done. Um, it took a lot of persistence and a lot of tenacity to get things done at times. The same as when you're in a startup, you need to just keep pursuing. But 
if you look at what the city has become, I believe it's been ranked the cleanest city in the world. Dubai Airport is the busiest airport in the world. Um, their passport is one of the strongest. And I think that when you're surrounded by people who run a country and you live here, you can really learn a lot. And when all of that's taken care of and it works, you can get on with the rest of your job. I mean, I do a lot of travel. I think you, you mentioned that. And I can get from my apartment to the checkout, check-in desk at D Dubai Airport through security all within 30 minutes. From ah. getting into the airport to actually getting into the lounge and at the gate is no more than 10 minutes. And when you remove all of the headaches of airports like in LAX or in SFO or London Heathrow, you can wait longer in the airport than you've been on the plane. And sometimes that just puts you in a bad mood and the frustration kicks in. When you remove all of those, you you really can get down to work. And I feel very lucky and grateful to be here. I have a, a little girl who's uh, seven and you know her life is now here. She has a wonderful life. Um, it does get hot in the summer, but other than that, Dubai is a fantastic city. We have a common connection point that I don't even know if you realize, uh, and that is affiliation with Startup Grind. So I learned oh, cool. through doing some research that you used to run the Startup Grind Dubai chapter. I currently am one of the co-directors for Startup Grind Chicago's community. Um, what was your experience like running Startup Grind Dubai and what sort of, you know, in bringing, I guess, that community to a new city, what would you say you learned about the networking there and the ability to establish something new there? Well, I mean, uh, first point to note is that Derek is actually a, a fantastic friend and he's also on my board as well. The, ah, the, the the CEO of, of and he's referring Grind. to Derek Anderson, the uh, CEO of Startup Grind. Yeah, so Startup Grind for me really started back in 2011 when I was currently working for Groupon, the Daily Deals website, yeah. and had an idea to start my own business. I just moved over from London where there was a startup community that was quite active. In Dubai, it was very difficult. There were no co-working co spaces. There were no meetups. It was very new, um, and the kind of urban cafe style didn't exist. Um, and reading TechCrunch one day, I stumbled across Startup Grind's events, and I thought, this is awesome. We need this here in Dubai. So I reached out to Derek, um, and at the time, um, one of his uh, colleagues was helping me get the city set up. We got it up and running. I then was given the kind of routine of what you have to do. You have to find people in your city that are well-known entrepreneurs, get a fireside chat, then sell tickets, and put it together, record it, and send it back to Startup Grind. Well, lucky for me, I worked at Groupon. So I put the event on Groupon, um, and we sold out. We sold 150 tickets. Uh -huh. um, they were like 100 bucks each. Uh, it was the most, and I think probably to this day is the most revenue generating event that happened. Yeah, we, we, we do like $15 tickets for our events. <laughs> yeah, you had food and everything. And we were, I think we were the eighth city. You know, they're now in like 100,000 plus cities around the world, maybe more. There's 600 um, around the globe now. Yeah, 600 cities around the globe. And you know, that that's incredible. We were number eight. Um, and yeah, it just, it worked. You know, we just brought people together. I ended up actually raising some money for my first startup from the first startup grind event. Hmm. Um, and, and it really put it on the map. Um, back in then, in 2011, 2012, I was praised for helping start the startup ecosystem here. Um, wrote a lot of articles, was interviewed by a lot of people, CNN, Forbes, Entrepreneur Magazine. Um, and, and Startup Grind really kicked that off. And, you know, me and Derek have become friends and, and close buddies ever since um seen each other's journeys grow kids been born um and yeah it's just been an awesome journey i'm actually speaking there in april um in i'll uh, see you at the april. conference then i'll be there so we'll meet in person yeah. that's um, great i'm going to be interviewing the uh, cto of dapper labs the uh, guy that came up with the name nft so that's going to be pretty cool huh. uh, at redwood city so yeah awesome connection please do me a favor and ask him why of all words to choose did, did this person choose non-fungible token because there are a million okay. things that could have been chosen that would have been better <laughs> i mean it's already on my list i've already got my <laughs> number one <laughs> all right so 
you know, you've got this coming up within the startup ecosystem in Dubai. You're obviously very entrepreneurial. You have a couple endeavors before cheese comes into play. So, you know, you you build cheese, you start building cheese a few years ago. Can you talk through, you know, I gave a very, very brief introduction at the beginning and it is around NFTs. Can you talk through, give our listeners a little bit more insight into what cheese is and, and how did you come up with this idea in the first place? Yeah, sure. So it actually dates back to 2015 when my daughter was born. Um, and back then I used to run a digital agency, which was called Brandster. It was an API agency that connected brands and social media companies and dovetailed them together. One of the big products we had were was the use of a camera where you could trigger a camera using tweets or Facebook likes, and it was a really popular product that we were selling. Unfortunately, in 2017, we got hit by Cambridge Analytica scandal, and that company started to suffer because all APIs were shut off. But one of the main features we had was this product to be able to share photos in a organized manner. So if you imagine like a dovetail between Slack and WhatsApp, when you have a, a child and you have relatives that live abroad, you're constantly sharing photos in iMessage or WhatsApp, and it's just a, a linear feed of photos. And there's no organization. You don't know what you've sent. So one of the products I said to the guys who we had at the time was like, could you try and build a prototype for this problem I have with my daughter and my family trying to solve these problems with the photos? When in 2017, a company started to um, suffer, I basically jumped on a plane to San Francisco. I was at, I was at the Startup Grind Conference, the global conference. Um, and after the event, I went down to the uh, Palo Alto Apple store. I went in there to go and try and buy some AirPods. And I was talking to the store manager there. And he said, why are you here? What are you doing? And I just said, I've got this app. I'm just trying to meet people and show it to them. And he turned around and said, well, I don't know much about apps, but my friend does. And you know, if you've got time, maybe you can meet him. Um, and long story short, I went to Menlo Park to uh, Stack, sat down, and, and then walked Guy Kawasaki. And the guy's friend at the Apple store was Guy Kawasaki. He sat down and uh, shared some pancakes together, had some coffee. I showed him what the app was, and he said, I have this problem as well with my family. And uh, yeah, if you fast forward a year after that, we then in 2018 presented version one of cheese at startup grind event in uh, redwood city <laughs> um and uh, that was the first that was the first iteration of cheese back in 2018 so that kind of brings us into our main topic here which is attracting big name advisors now you already alluded to guy kawasaki just kind of walking in but let's let's just unpack that a little bit more it was by chance that guy walked in there was like a scenario set up that you you were planning to meet him anyways like what were the conditions that allowed this to happen that you end up showing your app to guy kawasaki it literally was nothing more than being in silicon valley in palo alto in the apple store um being a big tech nerd and an apple fanboy i wanted a pair of the apple airpods the first version um and they weren't available in dubai so i walked into apple store talking to Somebody who actually ended up being the store manager, a guy called Bada. Um, he's originally from Turkey. Uh, we just got talking. You know, he said, "Oh, where where have you come from?" I said, "Dubai," and we just stood talking for about half an hour. Um, I showed him the app, and then it was he who said, "Let me text my friend." And he, the person he texted was Guy Kawasaki, and uh, and, and that's basically how it came about. And uh, having met Guy and sat down with Guy, you know, we hit it off. We we really got on well. Um, he said, look, I, I get presented a lot of products each year and I see a lot of startup founders. He said, I need to run it by my trusted inner circle. So I then extended my trip and stayed there a little longer. Um, when I met his friends in Santa Cruz, um, met some of his buddies and, and business partners in Palo Alto, uh, met his family, I met some of his uh, his kids as well. And yeah, everybody came back and said, this is a cool product. And then guys said, look, let's let's kick off a business. So we then set the company up in Delaware and, and off we went. And that was, that, like I say, that was version one of the product and, and it evolved into what it is now. Obviously things changed during lockdown and during lockdown, we, we stumbled across photography NFTs um, and any entrepreneur and any startup will know that if you 
see a product declining in user base, you have to pivot. And so in 2020, mm. we pivoted Cheese into an NFT focused photography platform rather than just a messaging platform. Um, but yeah, that's how me and Guy met back in uh, 2017 in Stacks in Menlo Park. <laughs> Now, Which do doesn't you, have Wi-Fi, by the way. So <laughs> if you are going to present an app, make sure you've got roaming or data because it doesn't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> FYI. Um, do you recall, though, you know, he said he's he's he looks at a lot of product demos all the time and gets pitched on a lot of things. Do you recall specifically, you know, were you showing it to him a certain way or were you handling that conversation a certain way? And was there a specific, like, get or ask you had in mind in the process or was it more just like enthusiasm i think it was i think to be honest i was taken purely by surprise in the fact that um i was meeting him i went in the apple store in the morning uh stopped at starbucks then got an uber to menlo park and in the afternoon i was sat with guy um and i just think the honesty and transparency is is what it was um, you know, I, I wanted to show somebody that could give me feedback and Guy is an unbelievable uh, person to give you feedback. He'll always be honest, uh, you know, and um, sometimes it's a hard pill to swallow, mm. but you know, you've got to listen to this. And I think that that's what I did. And yeah, it was just, uh, it was just a, a meeting of minds. I think, you know, we both had the same vision on certain things. Um, he could tell that I had really put this together and had thought about it the product was very well built the brand was very well put together you know it took us three years to obtain the full cheese.com register the trademarks um and when you you can see that a mile off i think mm. um and yeah and it, to be honest it was just literally having a chat and and then it evolved and we just you know we became friends as well and business partners i speak to him frequently and seeing whenever i'm in town um yeah it's just a general natural chat i think nothing special really uh you also have mark randolph as we mentioned during the introduction or earlier on in this conversation mm -hmm. co-founder of netflix uh as part of your board of advisors and you kind of alluded to that and you came from you know reading and reaching out can you just uh explain that story a little bit more a little bit more detail yeah, sure. So that, that's quite a funny one because um, having been back and forth to San Francisco and Palo Alto Bay Area for a number of years, um, I was lucky enough. One of my friends uh, in built a good network of people. My friends in the area had just bought a Tesla, um, and he was like, "Look, when you're in town, you can uh, you can take it out for a spin." Um, well, people who live in kind of Menlo Park, Palo Alto, often go to Santa Cruz over the mountains and spent time there guy does a lot of surfing there and um i was reading i oh, was reading i was listening to guy to mark randolph's book that'll never work on an audiobook um and had it on in a tesla and i was testing out the self drive mode in the tesla so i'm actually just sat there not <laughs> not driving just on my phone taking photos and videos listening to it's a bold move That's you're putting a lot of trust into that early uh yeah. early engine there and and to be honest with you, it was cool. But what was such an iconic moment is in in one of the chapters in the book, Mark talks about driving over the Santa Cruz mountains because he he lives and is based in Santa Cruz. Driving over the mountains with Reed Hoffman, um, yeah, Reed Hoffman, no, Reed Hastings. Sorry, Reed Hastings, who's the uh, yeah, other yeah. co-founder. And the exact point I was traveling in the Tesla. The book was talking about him traveling the other way. And so I just was like, this is a, cr a crazy iconic moment. So I, I simply sent him an email and I just said, look, I found your book super fascinating. Um, had to just say this, what happened to me about an hour or so ago. Um, and it turns out that him and Guy live very close to each other, but had never met. And um, he said, look, I, I love the fact that you've got Guy on board. I would, if you don't mind, would you mind introducing me? So... I introduced Denmark and Guy together. Um, and then off the back of that conversation, two or three months later, Mark then ended up investing in the company. Um, and then a year and a half later, I uh, had a change of the board. We had some people moving around and I then invited him to join the board um, last May. And he said yes, and he's now on the board alongside me 
Derek and Guy, which is uh, awesome. Now, that email that you sent, first question, did you thumb it while you were in self-driving mode in the car? No, I did. I, okay. I, 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 I actually sat in, uh, I was actually sat waiting to meet Guy. You know, we go to this place in uh, Santa Cruz called Cat and Cloud, where they do an amazing uh, lemon and b- banana cake. So I sat eating that, drinking a cappuccino, and I wrote it wrote it in the ca- in the coffee shop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So interestingly, like, you essentially wrote a piece of fan mail, right, to Mark. Essentially, I think, again, I think that I, I was, I, I never really, my intention when I email these people is never really to ask. I'm not asking for anything. It's more that I always think if I was in the position of having spent hours and hours writing a book and recording a book, and Mark narrates the book too, it's a lot of work, um, you know, and I know when I put a lot of effort into shareholder reports and things, when I get responses from people, it it just means a lot. And I think that you you kind of just respect the fact that anybody can do that, but not everybody does. Mm. Um, and it was just simply just to say, look, this was such a an iconic moment for me and one that I'll never forget. Um, and just thank you for writing such a great book because it, it genuinely is an amazing book. And at times when you're an entrepreneur, you often have doubts in your mind. But if you can think to yourself, well, okay, Netflix is what it is now. But at one point in time, people had these had these difficulties. And Mark's such a family man and Guy's such a family man. And, and I respect that more than anything in the fact that, you know, kids and, and that, if you have them, are, are priority. And I, and I love the fact that they both prioritize the fact of family. And yeah, just sent him an email to say, thanks for writing a great book. And by the way, I was, you know, in a Tesla at the same place you were about 20 years previous. So and that's now really in that to. email then though, did you mention, Hey, here's what I'm build, building with cheese. Or did you just kind of like end it at, thank you for writing the book. And then he replied, tell me more about yourself. Um, I'll have to check. I think that I, I mentioned that I was off to meet guy, um, in Santa Cruz. Um, and I mean, obviously I, I have a signature with what I'm doing and in sure. the signature, it's like a video and things. But it was more, I think, just, again, as it's always been about the respect of the book. Um, and books and books are, you know, they're a startup in themselves. You've got to, you've got to do them and you've got to execute. Mm. Um, and I think that it was more about that. But yeah, I, I, I'll have to check and see how the exact conversation went. But um, it was, yeah, it was more about, I think connecting Mark and Guy together that started it off. And I think it would maybe be Guy that would have given him more information on what we were doing um, as to how it, how, it was, how it evolved. So funny enough, uh, years back, this would have been in 2016, I believe, I read Phil Knight, the founder of Nike. I read his book, Shoe Dog. Yeah. And that, in a similar way, profoundly moved me. And I had, uh, you know, I also had one of those moments of like, what are my problems? You know, if, if I like look at what Nike had to go through, <laughs> like I didn't have yeah. Adidas arming the U.S. government against me at any point, and having like putting like trying to force trade embargoes on my product. Um, yeah. So you know, it was very much, a, and and I was at, at the time of reading it, I was at like a very like entrepreneurial low point. So it was very helpful and what I needed to read in that moment. And I actually wrote a handwritten letter, like and mailed it to. Um, Phil Knight at the and sent him to his office at the Nike headquarters, and I really didn't expect it. It was really just it was it was a thank you letter. It was like, hey, thank you for writing this. This was really meaningful to me. It helped me in these ways, etc. Um, and you can't see it here, but what I have behind this computer screen is a framed letter back from Phil Knight, um, acknowledging my my mail to him and saying thank you for reading it it was a labor of love it's you know it's really nice for you to say that with his signature at the bottom um so i i I 100 relate to that ability to just acknowledge someone for the work they have put in and i and i think what's interesting is we often think oh because someone has a let's say a brand name like their name is a brand name essentially we often think that they always hear from everyone. Yeah. But I think the reality is like, if you just think about our own behavior, like how many times do you read a book and never think to tell the author you have read their book? And yeah. that's it. 
majority, right? And that's what happens, I think, in the majority of cases, if someone has written a book or done whatever, like you just kind of think that like other people are out there giving them praise. And there might be general like media attention, but they, I think they don't often hear from the individual consumer nearly as often as we might assume they do. And so when you do have that just extra little touch point to say like, again, I acknowledge you for doing this work. I do think it's quite meaningful to them. And I think that's what you're saying is, is how you've been able to kind of establish some of these relationships. Yeah. And I think the bottom line is that, you know, I never approach any of these relationships and never even to this day do and with regards to, to money and funding and, and what people associate, you know, famous people in whatever respect with. And I think that is literally genuinely me praising them for their their craft that they have managed to do a fantastic job at and you know guys i think he's on his 14th book now um you know and, and mark is writing i think his second or his third um and still again you know it's it's a passion of theirs and i think that 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 if they have people acknowledge it which i just again my meeting with guy was by chance um my meeting with Mark was me reaching out. Um, but the same thing happened with, you know, with Greg. I read his book and and emailed him. Um, because again, it was just such a um a moving book for a stage that I was in. Um and didn't really expect anything just other than that, you know, loved his book and we had a Zoom call and just hit it off. And I think that's the key. You know, if if you can connect with somebody and have a chat, um, then, you know, it's like a relationship, isn't it? Your first date goes well, you're going to speak to them again. So we're going to expand on that a little bit more that idea of building the relationships. But first, um, I just want to talk to our listeners for a moment as you think about this idea of relationship building. And as Simon previously talked about, you know, being able to just quickly show cheese his product to someone like Guy Kawasaki, you know, kind of on the spot. I want to just ask you, where are you at? listeners in your own product development. Because if you're struggling to get a product off the ground, or if you've got a product developed and you need to start scaling it up, perhaps it's time to introduce a partner into your own relationship with your product and with your community. And I've got the perfect partner for you. They go by the name of Akeva. In fact, they are the software development partner that's going to help you go from zero to one. And whether that means you're building on the blockchain or no chain, whether you're on Web3 or Web2, whether it's a mobile app or a SaaS product, Akeva built it at startup speed and enterprise level refinement. That's why startups like Stride Health, Haveno, Olive, Side, and so many more trust Akeva from their first dollar all the way to their billion dollar valuation. And they are ready to help you become the goat to market. I will tell you, anytime someone asks me for a software developer recommendation or a development company, I, I say, go to Akeva. They know exactly what they're doing. Their co-founder is also a tech startup founder separately himself. So he knows exactly like what it is you are going through in your journey. And I think they don't just have like the professional skill set, but they have that that I think that missing level of empathy for the founder journey that so many other companies fail to acknowledge, but Akeva's got that. They've got the empathy. They know what it's like to be a founder uh, and they know what it's like to build great products. And that's why you should look into Akeva as your partner for software development. You can learn more at akeva.io. Again, that's Akeva, A-K-A-V-A.io. And tell me you heard about them on Startup Hype Man's Goat to Market Show. We are here today with... Simon Hudson from Cheese. We're talking about attracting big name advisors. And Simon explained the story of meeting Guy Kawasaki and then Mark Randolph from Netflix. And Mark's was off of the off of reading his book and reaching out. Now, Simon, one of the things, and you, you started to touch on this before the break. One of the things you've talked about, you know, in, in our previous conversation off air was ask for advice and not investment. Can mm -hmm. you expand on that a little bit more? And, and why do you think it is that most people immediately think to ask for an investment? I think that one of the biggest um, mistakes that people can make is people think that money is 
what is required to be successful in business. And I think that, you know, money does obviously need to be in the mix, that's for sure. But when you have the money, you also need to be able to know what to do with it. And startups and companies such as Netflix, and, and me and Mark actually had this conversation not too long ago when we were struggling to raise funding at the end of last year. And you know, I just simply asked him, I said, you know, what's your advice? What would you suggest? And people are able to give you pointers and really make you open your eyes to what you know the answer is, but you just need somebody to tell you what it is that you have to do. And that reassurance of having somebody who's been through it before that you trust implicitly with what your business is can really help you make those changes that make you a better founder and a better entrepreneur. And I think that for me, I've never really been the type of person that's been able to ask for investment once I'm confident that the product is at a point where I, you know, once having my own money, put it in myself. Um, and I'm still learning, you know, I, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been doing this for a long time, but every day I learn something. Um, and I think just asking for advice, um, if people are willing to share it, you build a relationship. And if people trust you, then they will connect you with people um, who might be investors. But again, it should never be the entry point to any relationship. You should never just want to speak to somebody about getting money. I think, you know, you want to kind of build a relationship because the moment that money exchanges hands, you're in a relationship anyway. The marriage is there. So it's mm. better to know the person you're marrying before you sign the group, sign the contract and get into the relationship. Before you put a ring on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How would you recommend identifying, you know, whether it's advisors or investors, how would you recommend a founder goes about identifying, oh, this is the right person for our company? It's a, it's a, it is a great question. I actually had this uh, conversation with somebody not too long ago. I'm, I'm obviously in Dubai. Dubai is a very wealthy place. You can raise money fairly easy here, um, but not necessarily from people that would help you in your business moving forward because the type of investors that they are are mainly real estate investors who yeah. are used to exits and having actual assets behind their investment, not necessarily into tech and IP. One of the big things I've always done is look on news, tech crunch, tech meme, crunch base, keep an eye on who's raising money, who who's raised what money. Um, and if a business is similar to what you're doing, what similar space, um, reach out to them, reach out to them and say, you know, you saw that you just invested in company X, you're building a product that's similar and would they be interested to take a look at your deck and your memo and proposal? Mm. Um, and just identify it through, through that and also ask people in your network as you do this for a long period of time, your network grows, you know more people, you meet more people, you get more no's. The people that say no, you know, they're always somebody to reach out to in the future um, and just build up a database. I've been building up an Airtable for years now of people I speak to um, and you know what they're looking for. There's a lot of great investors that we spoke to in pre-seed and we were too early. We had to have a product. We had to have some traction. Our ticket size was too small. You know, they only invested a minimum of 2 to $3 million. Yeah. So you go back to them later and say, hey, we're now in a position. We spoke a couple of years ago. Would you be interested to view our updated deck and start the conversation again? Build relationships over time. Don't just yeah. be on the hunt for hunt for money at all times. Yeah. I mean, I, I I look at any type of relationship, whether or not it's friendship, romance, or business, it's the same. You 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 can't just have a friend that you meet and say, Hey man, how are you? And then you become best buddies overnight. It <laughs> takes time. You have to have good and bad times. Same in relationships romantically. You don't just meet somebody and get married day one unless you're on a reality TV show. But other than that, you know, like it takes a while to build that relationship and it should be the same in business because you'll end up speaking to people in business a lot more than you will most people if you're in startup mode. How do you, so how do you couch that against like, you know, if a startup's actively fundraising and they're maybe want to close around in like three months or something like that, I guess, is your advice still, hey, first build a relationship over a couple of months, then say you're raising capital? Or is there a change in action or mindset there? I think if you are well organized and planned, you know well in advance when you're going to need to raise capital. 
Mm. So, you know, if you know that your runway is coming thin, um, you can identify market is changing. You need to start to think about raising money six months to a year beforehand. That's why when people close around, they're out raising again because this was literally a stepping stone. Um, and identifying the markets, obviously, you know, so luck has a lot to play in some cases where you get introduced to the right person um, who's interested in investing. You might be in a city traveling or a conference, you meet somebody. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, if you plan ahead, um, you know when you need to raise money and you can kind of build up relationships ahead of time. Do you um, feel that um, investors are happy to... Let me backtrack for a second. Investors will largely say they are very busy people. They get pitch decks sent to them, you know, 50 times a day and it's a lot to pour through, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you feel that they will take time if you were to ask them Hey, would you give us some feedback on our product or on our or on our deck or something like that? Do you think they would do that as opposed to, you know, I think I guess would you would they do that and break up their existing workflow, um, or is it something that they say oh, that's a lot of effort and I'm I'm not here to give free advice? I think that if you've been able to get a an introduction or a meeting with an investor and they've shown interest and they do due diligence or they look into the product a bit further and say no, it's always worth asking for the reasons why. Um, mm. And you'll just start to build a pattern. It will either be traction. They need to see traction. They need to have you know a proof of concept. There needs to be uh, a good go-to-market strategy. Um, this is a sector that may not be for them. Um, and you know, it's the kind of 110-1 rule. It's the same in investment, same in sales. You, you speak to 100 people, 10 people say yes, one person puts a deal in. So if you can kind of work on that ratio, you know that, okay, cool. If you speak to 10 people and only one person says yes, then you're going to have nine no's, which is going to be nine feedbacks. And then every time, tweak the deck, change it, put a system in place where you can track and see who's read it, what pages they find interesting, follow up with them. Um, and again, just keep everybody in the loop. I think communication is key. Mm -hmm. Dropping somebody an email saying, hey, we've just implemented AI in our product might be something that they're interested in, or it might just be something you've planted a seed for future down down the road. So yeah, I think just ask. Again, the same as everything. Just if you, if you don't know, you, if you don't ask, you don't know. Um, <laughs> and that's, yeah, that would be my my advice for sure. Let's go to our wrap up now. Um, first, where can our listeners find you and where can they learn more? So for cheese, it's uh, cheese.com. That's C-H-E-E-Z-E.com. Uh, we're cheese on all social handles. For me personally, I'm at Hudson on Twitter. Um, and you can also find me on podcasts like this and just Google my name. It tends to show up. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, at Hudson on Twitter is really where you'll find me mainly. Kudos for getting the handle of just at cheese. Uh, that seems like it would have been claimed yeah. long ago. <laughs> Again, it's it's you know it's a hustle. It's uh, it takes time. Same as at Hudson, you know, it takes a takes a bit of time. You've got to build relationships and um, and understand how these processes work. So, <laughs> yeah, feel very grateful for that. We are going to now do our top one or two lessons or takeaways for the listeners based on the discussion today. I'll go first and I'll toss it to you. The topic today was attracting big name advisors. And I would say the kind of the prevailing lesson I've got out of this conversation is be willing to be in the 1% who chooses to reach out because the 99% won't. And you may not get it right the first time, but if you keep being that 1% person, eventually you will have the right message to the right person who's going to respond in the right way. Yeah, I agree. I think um, somebody once said to me, failure is only feedback. Mm. You know, if, if, you are to, if you are told no and you, and you are thirsty enough, it's just a bump in the road. It's... Uh, it shouldn't deteriorate you from wanting to progress further. And if you know you genuinely are all in and passionate about what you're doing, then I know it's just a a hurdle you need to climb across. And uh, yeah, you're right. Just if you like what somebody's doing, just send them an email um, or 
reach out to them. If their email is publicly available, then you know they want to be contacted. It's very different if you troll people and hound people. That's a very, I would never advise that to just bombard people. Mm. Um, but it's, it's the same. It's just if you use manners and, and polite, same as you would be in person, um, and they want to speak to you, they'll come back to you definitely. It's always nice to be, uh, you know, if you're creating products, to be told that it's helped somebody is always a nice feeling. My final question, which is how we end every episode on this show, fill in the blank, Simon. Entrepreneurship is blank. A journey. Why a journey? Because it doesn't really ever have a start and an end in terms of what you might think. And depending on whatever the journey might be, a journey can consist of a trip to the shops or a flight to Dubai. Uh, every journey has a different duration. And I think that an entrepreneurship entering into that is a journey. And you've just got to be willing to, uh, yeah, just to follow the map where it takes you. Um, and eventually, I would say ending the journey becomes when you potentially sell that or get acquired, whatever people dream of. But when you speak to people that have done that, then another journey begins. So uh, I would say entrepreneurship is a journey. Entrepreneurship is a journey. He is Simon Hudson, the founder and CEO of Cheese. And guess what? He'll be joining us after this episode is aired for the next week inside of the Goat to Market Club for an Ask Me Anything exclusively for Goat to Market Club members. So if you want, if you were listening to this and you were like, oh, that I got to ask him about this now. This is your chance. Join the Goat to Market Club. Simon will be doing an all week long Ask Me Anything. You want to ask him about Guy Kawasaki or Mark Randolph a little bit more or Greg Hoffman. You want to ask him, hey, can you copy paste the email you sent so I know what to do? You want to ask him for fundraising tips. You want to ask him about product development, any of these things he's community building, any of these things he's got experience in. It is an ask Simon anything. So it's all on the table. You want to ask him how he's raising his daughter. You can ask him that as well, I think, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> so you can talk about I mean, the good life lessons you're you're imparting onto her. Um, all of this the is going to happen inside of the Goat to Market Club. So you just the thing is, you got to be a member to join or to, to participate in this, and you can join at startuphypeman.com slash gtm dash club. Startuphypeman.com slash gtm dash club. It is free to join, and then it is nine dollars a month after your first month being free. You can cancel anytime. So. You can stick around if you want, or you could get the AMA from Simon and then bounce before you ever pay a dime up to you. We hope you'll stick around, but if you don't, no hard feelings. That'll do it for today on the Goat to Market show. We will catch you next time. And thank you once again to Simon Hudson for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Cheers. That does it for this week's episode. Thank you again to our guests for joining and sharing their knowledge. Did you like what you heard? Well, leave us a rating and review on your podcast app before you head out of here. And while you're at it, who's one friend who you think would find value in hearing today's conversation? Go ahead and share the episode with them. I would really appreciate it. And I thank you for doing that. Remember, we've got more going down with our guest inside Goat to Market Club. Think of it like the after show, the after party, the after hours special. Our guest is going to hop inside the club and do an Ask Me Anything. So you can follow up with any of those questions that came to mind as you were listening. You can follow up and ask them to our guest inside our club. To join, just head to startuphypeman.com slash gtm dash club. Startuphypeman.com slash gtm dash club gtm club is nine dollars a month but your first month is free you can cancel anytime and you're not only getting the amas you're also getting our monthly strategy drops that are for members only where we're teaching hyper specific tactical go-to-market strategies plus cool member-to-member -member interactions and other bonus resources all of that happens inside the club so again startuphypeman.com slash gtm dash club we'll see you inside the club and we'll see you next week but before you head out remember why be a unicorn when you can be the goat <laughs>